It is my very great pleasure to introduce Irene Gonzalez Perez, who is a midwife in Tenerife, Tenerife, where the sun shines. Lucky person. Anyway, <laughs> she completed her midwifery training in London and is now a doctoral student. And this presentation is based on her doctoral studies. Birth plans and women having choices as a new concept in Spain. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to you, Irene, and I'm going to find out where that interference with sound is coming from. So Great, can you thanks. now see, can you now see the, yeah. the yes, fabulous. Okay, I'll also yeah, mute myself. You. So it's just you. Thank hopefully. you, Linda. You're welcome. Hello, good morning, everyone, or afternoon, evening. I don't know where what she's coming from, uh, but welcome and happy day of the midwives. Um, I just wanted to say that English is not my first language, so apologies in advance. Um, please feel free to ask if you don't uh, get anything or just to interrupt and use these little text, uh, chat room on the left so um, so we can have um, a smooth um, presentation. Um, as Linda say, this is part of my PhD. So literally, literature from this presentation comes from Spain in the UK, and even I think I've got something from New Zealand and Australia. Um, but before we start, I would like to see uh, what are you expecting from this session. So um, I've got a few questions from you. What would you like to hear today? Um, have you worked with birth plans before? What's your opinion on birth plans or do you find them useful? Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. <laughs> We're pleased to have Linda today. She's one of the uh, promoters of the birth plans, uh, which it, um, feel very lucky to work with her today. Yeah, especially yeah, with that, they've got unconventional um, choices, issues as FGM. Thank you, Michaela. Very useful, essential, I like the word essential. Yes, um, Laura Richard says uh, the bed plans are an opportunity for research, for women to research. I also think that's very true. Right, let's move on. And to start with, I think we need to define what a birth plan is. So for the UK, the health system, the um, NHS, the National Health System, they define a birth plan as a record of what you would like to happen during your labour and after the birth. And then I've got this Spanish um, definition from the Ministry of Health um, where they say that a birth plan is a document in which the pregnant woman expresses her preferences, needs, desires, and expectations about the process of birth. Um, a birth plan is also a legal document in most of the countries, and um, it acts also as a consent form, and they should be personalized and unique. I would also like to clarify that birth plans are dynamic documents. That means that they might change and they might vary um, as the labor progresses um, because labors are not static and births are dynamic as well. Having said that, uh, those are the most common choices and preferences that we find in most of the uh, pro forma birth plans. So this one is from the NHS, again from the UK. Um, those are the uh, choices that they get to have, the women. So they can choose the place of birth, like uh, to 
previously have um, um, birth centers or a home birth, who's going to be with her? So who's going to be her birth partner? Um, is she going to go for any pain relief options, medical, um, pharmacological or non-pharmacological um, pain reliefs? And so on. And I've got an example. Can you see? I hope they say I shouldn't be using pictures, but <laughs> I find that this one is very, um, very um, good in terms of these person uh, or this couple um, consider lots of choices from early stage of labor like induction staying at home as long as possible and they even consider also um, newborn procedures or preferences if things have created from normality you can see the c-section issue here I'm just reading Linda here on the chat and she say um, she asked to give my baby her first breath because I've loved the smell of a newborn baby. That's true. <laughs> well, let's move on. And before we get to the main body of this presentation, I would like to go through the history of the birth plan. There we go. Um, we cannot understand the history of the birth plan without three main processes within the 20th century. These are medicalization, institutionalization, and industrialization. So uh, the move to hospitals, um, moving the birth to hospital settings, was a major shift in the philosophy of care. Um, not only to women, who experienced the pathologization of childbirth, but also to the midwife, who um, began to work under doctors or obstetricians' control and shifted towards obstetric nurses. That means they, some of them even lost skills, midwifery skills that they have while being independent midwives, having and working at home settings and assisting home births. Um, the paternalism emerged and the authoritative knowledge of the obstetrician commenced. Um, in some country, we still even have some paternalism as a model of care in which health professionals are still the ones who make the decisions and women, uh, pregnant women, follow their instructions. We can say it like that. Then uh, uh, the culture and the social uh, society tend to be with the institution, even the midwife, rather than being with the woman. And they started to conceive the woman's body as a machine and the baby as a product. Luckily, the World Health Organization and some feminist groups emerge and fight for women's rights. So in the 70s, the Society for the Support of Home Deliveries and also the WHO um, um, and also the Wire Ribbon Alliance in 1999 um, started to fight for these uh, rights that women lost with all these medicalization process. Especially Last year, the WHO um, recommended birth plans as a tool to support um, women's decision and to get birth experiences, especially positive birth experiences that they were for, uh, forgotten uh, within all these processes because they really um, were focused on having healthy physical uh, and normal deliveries, but they forgot the psychology, mental side and the dimension of birth. According 
to Osmore and Grady. Women's autonomy and decision making are essential in maternity care. We also know that those women who have been involved in decision making have better outcomes and better better experiences. Um, writing a breath plan provides also a greater degree of autonomy and control to the women, therefore promotes decision making during pregnancy, labor, and the postpartum period. But we cannot understand the breath plans we saw some keywords from the literature and from guidelines. From autonomy, not only for women, but also for midwives. So, um, women have to be able to make choices, to be free to decide and opt for what they think is convenient for her and baby. On the other side, for midwives, they should be able to work as independent professionals uh, with physiological birth and also to be accountable to make their own decisions. In terms of woman choices, they need to be able to opt and to choose for what they think is best for them um, within their family, their culture and their beliefs. Also, women's rights as an individual, as a pregnant woman, and as a woman per se, especially when it comes to equal rights and to gender equality and discrimination against women. Um, but we will discuss women's rights in deep later on. We've got light on that. There's also a processes uh, which is not only hard for women, but also for professionals. and. Uh, some systems, some healthcare systems have found that professionals should have a tool to support the decision making progress. Holistic care, also called woman centre of care, family focused care, um, in fact, is a model of care who takes uh, into account the woman as a whole. Uh, this means she, her family, her community, her beliefs, etc. And we mentioned that with all this medicalization process, the importance of mental health um, was um, not considered. So those two models of care, partnership model and biopsychosocial model, um, encourage the importance of considering mental health and the emotional and psychological dimension of birth while looking after and, and while caring for women in labour. And also, it's important to say that psychological dimension cannot be easily separated from the physical dimension of labour. We can see that even the, sorry, this is the Spanish <laughs> um, name of the WHO, um, and they also um, recognize that being involved in decision to pregnancy, have positive birth experiences and better psychological outcomes. And also, I would like to highlight that um, culture makes an impact on perception of childbirth. Um, we mentioned the holistic care and the partnership care in which we need to consider a woman as a whole and as her beliefs, her culture, her family, and um, to every single woman, perception is different, is subjective. Um, like for example, a good birth experience could be a section because um, this woman was informed and she got to be the center of her labor. Um, while for another woman, uh, woman who had a vaginal birth uh, without epidural, uh, this could be the worst experience ever for her because she requested a epidural that she didn't got. So that is not a good experience for her. 
That means that uh, every single birth experience is unique, subjective, and the definition and the perception that every woman has about a birth might change. Um, I would like to say that there is a new term for this that they have been using lately in the UK, in the United Kingdom, and it's called the optimal birth, which defines how opti um, which optimal uh, differs from one woman to another one. In the next slide, we've got the load, and it's only a bit of international law, okay, because I didn't want to go through um, Spain or the UK or anything, just mostly international. Um, if you see, uh, we've got the human rights, um, and then I like this. Um, CDAW, the Committee of the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women on 1979, um, and the uh, European Convention on Human Rights. Also, we've got ethical principles, uh, which are closely related to legal aspects when you're looking after someone, and these are the four main ones which should support our practice every single day in our daily basics. Um, here we go, some articles which are uh, really linked to birth plans. So, uh, the right of being care, the right of having not discrimination against women, prohibition of discrimination as the European Convention of Human Rights says, And now, let's focus on our main topic. So, the good of the birth plans. Um, the first one, it's that by acquiring new knowledge, the women, uh, the birth plan empowers women. It also educates the women about all the options. And some women say that they feel more secure when completing their birth plans. Uh, the birth plans include the pregnant women in the decision-making progress, and it is a written record of her preferences, choices, and needs, um, like in case of anything that happens. There are more good sides of the birth plans. Um, it helps with the communication between the health professionals and the women and it structures the discussion between them, especially. Um, it's also a document of agreement between the choices and the woman's preferences. And it also shows women's preferences with the person who accompanied her, in case that person who is um, with her during labor has to decide for her. For some women, the birth plans reduce stress, uh, especially when women make unconventional choices, uh, which tend to fight um, uh, health professionals. However, there are some less good things of the birth plans, and one of them is that there is agreement about the benefits of the birth plans. There's still a controversial um, whether they should be used or not. And especially when it comes to perinatal outcomes, but um, we need more investigation on these, more study, because it's not clear if birth plans have been followed or, I mean, if the health professionals who were looking uh, after those women in labor and uh, who presented a birth plan, if those professionals sat and follow her birth plans or not. Um, in terms of birth plan document, they are only based on psychological, uh, sorry, physiological birth. 
that means the women's um, are no uh, don't learn sorry about complications or things that can deviate from normality uh, during labor so uh, complications like forceps in that sections are not discussed with these women and sometimes they get a false um, uh, expectation about labor. Um, there's also a conflict with planned, with the term plan. Uh, some people say that you cannot plan your birth ahead. Uh, births are dynamic, births are unpredictable and uh, we should think of including a term like uh, woman preferences or birth preferences in instead of birth plan. And the last bit here says that some um, as we they designed a birth plan and um, they made these proforma birth plans, they are now institutionally sized so with we're telling women you're are uh, we we're gonna go for a woman's center of care our main issue is making you feel unique your birth is um the your your choices are personal and your birth plan should be personalized but then we're given them a performer so um some of them don't even add their own choices to these performer birth plans because I need to say, I have to say, even if you get a piece of paper and you write there your birth plan, this is um, legal, this is okay. You can write a birth plan and you don't have to use the performer uh, birth plans which are given by the hospitals or by the health systems. Um, and the last bit of the less good, there we go. Is that do we really know if women's expectations are always respected? And um, even some women say they are not offered, they haven't been offered choices while they are in labor. Also, as we mentioned before, this sense of failure that they my experience when they do not achieve the expectations um, because they think only about the physiological birth and they didn't consider that things might change, things might deviate from normality and we cannot predict that unfortunately. There are also some women um, who designed their birth plans as interparty care guidelines uh, which is really um, unfair because they um, should have those options for granted i mean that evidence base or that uh, choices that the, the choices that they ask for are the ones that the guidelines recommend but in some hospitals are not still offered um, let's say um, for low risk women um, not having a line a cannula and, and these women have to ask for them not to have a line when they are in labor. Healthcare professionals are not familiar um, in some cases with birth plans, or sometimes their model of care that they've been promoting within that healthcare system cannot include a birth plan so let's say if we've got a paternalism system, um, it's going to be very hard to adopt a birth plan and the women's choices within that paternalism system. So it's going to be uh, the conflict between women and caregiving will arise, and especially because professionals tend to be reluctant to the use of a birth plan. Um, healthcare professionals also tend to forget the birth plans when emergencies um, emerge during labor. And um, a forced level of control is uh, sometimes promoted. Um, as we say, uh, do we offer choices or sometimes 
do we as health professionals limit those choices? Do we give them 100% and do we need to um, think about this as well? And in conclusion, before we, seen, we finish, I think that this is the, I hope you all can see this picture. I think, um, or I found that this is the best aim of the birth plan. Um, it's a process of becoming educated. Education empowers you, knowledge empowers you. So getting to know all your options and the, your choices make you have a better experience. But also, I've got another quote. This is just in case you couldn't see the picture. This is the, this is the same one. I've got this one, that the real achievement of the best plan uh, would be uh, it's disappearing so that we don't have to use a birth plan to communicate between midwives and women because uh, when there is a good mutual beneficial relationship among those two, um, you already know that that woman's uh, preferences. Thank you everyone. That is fabulous, Irene. Thank you so much. Any questions so far? Thank you all. Well, there's been a lot of comments. Um, I'll let you read the chat. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I couldn't. Been, I couldn't do that at the same I wasn't time. Being, I thought I would be able. <laughs> I wasn't being um, rotten when I said, don't get distracted, because uh, we do um, make comments as well as ask questions. So if you want to scroll back up a bit and see if there's anything you want to respond to. Mm -hmm. There's a good point there about birth plans being useful for women with special needs, such as female genital mutilation. Yeah, um, as um, it, there is a point in here, and when I say that some of, of the performer birth plans tends to institutionally say, sorry, um, tend to um, institutionally size um, women's labors, and so at the at the end of the day, we treat everyone uh, in the same way. When you have special need, you cannot be treated, and especially when you've got FGM, which is such an issue who has so much, um, who needs so much um, sensitive and um, special needs. So um, I think that, uh, especially when those different or unconventional issues are there, um, women, should be encouraged to have birth plans and as midwife as antenatal midwives you need to tell them why don't you uh write and why don't you complete your birth plan totally and agree please. irene yeah mm -hmm. i'm distracted gives the woman a voice <laughs> That was me, sorry. <laughs> Women should have the, the voice. Actually, if you have a good midwife um, communicating well with the women um, in a continuity of care away so that yes. they become they become partners in this process from pregnancy, then there wouldn't really be a need for a birth plan, would there? Yeah, I don't know how familiar are you with continuity of care. care sorry, it's just not the same. Have you heard about continuity of care? Everyone there, please. Because I know that New Zealand, Australia, and some countries are familiar, but like here in Spain, we didn't have um, any clue about that. And they've been uh, promoting this continuity of care uh, recently in the UK and other, con and other countries. Um, so the same midwife or the same team, small team of midwives, uh, look after a w one woman, one pregnant woman, and as a result, this midwife uh, gets to be looking after her during uh, pregnancy, labour, and postpartum period. 
And if she can't, if this midwife can't, another member of her team would go. But as they are small groups, uh, the, 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 the woman usually has met them all during pregnancy. So uh, relationship is better. Um, choices, preferences and needs are already in place because they've been um, getting to know each other for 40 weeks uh, or, or during, during pregnancy, sorry. Um, and at the end, they are together during labor as well. So um, these encourage uh, um, mutual and partnership model of care in which the birth plan shouldn't be needed. We have had continuity in carer for a long time in the UK, but it's kind of um, gone away and come back again and it's something we'd yeah. like to strive to. But the same as um, Michaela has said, it's an, it's an issue when we're short of midwives or midwives are not used to working to that, that pattern of care. So there's a little bit of resistance, but mm. there's so much, there's so much evidence supports good outcomes for um, women who are cared for by a, a midwife that they know. Yeah, um, they are very, uh, they are promoting this lately so much um, in the UK that, um, I don't know, it's, I think it all came back uh, after this birth plan study um, back in 2011 or 2014. So the research is, um, the evidence is very robust. So the experience is, breaks, sorry, women's birth experiences or um, perinatal outcomes is all much better when you have had continuity of care. So birth plans are useful if there's no continuity of care. That's what I see, I think is being said here. When there is no continuity of care, then you need to get to know your the the woman you're looking after in 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 labour, and you need to discuss the best plan with her, uh, which um, we usually forget. But when we meet someone, we need to go through her notes and we need to ask her what does she want, what is she expecting, uh, <coughs> what have she, what are her needs, and. Um, Something as simple as, do you want a pedural? I don't know. It's a matter of communication. It's fundamental and essential. We don't have, we can't not ignore communication even when we have a birth plan. So see, you need to ask her. And even if she doesn't complete a birth plan, you still need to have that conversation. You still need to um, talk to her and get to know her um, uh, needs and preferences. Yes, it's all about community communication, really, isn't it? Yeah, the cornerstone on midwifery care. So, in Spain, you told me the other day that mm -hmm. um, women getting choice and so consequently birth plans is a fairly new thing. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so uh, the first plan, birth plan was written in 2010, uh, so only nine years, and not only uh, is hard for uh, women, but for health professionals like midwives, obstetricians, and so on, um, because we are not used to um, this uh, model of care, and, uh, and we need to remember to give them choices to strength communication, um, it's a new system, actually. So who, who's in charge of childbirth in Spain? Is it the midwives or is it the obstetricians? It's still the obstetrician. We've got limited autonomy here, unfortunately. <laughs> Sorry, I <laughs> missed not... that. What was that? Say that again. Uh, it's still the obstetrician. We're not independent uh, midwives at all. So we still offer... Um, um obstetrician and midwife care we don't okay. have uh um, independent midwife at all 
it's not necessary to have independent midwives. It's good to have a partnership between the obstetrician and the midwife. Um, um, especially for, um, I mean, for, for low risk women, uh, for example, we don't yep. get to have the, 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 the autonomy to look after them uh, by ourselves. Okay. So the medical, um, the obstetricians then will probably um, interrupt this whole process that you're trying to encourage here of giving women choice and um, communication because they are notoriously it's not tricky. good at communication. It's tricky, yeah, for all of us. As I say, um, we're not. If, if you haven't worked with choices, if you haven't been on that um, system, um, even us as a midwife, we. We have to learn and we, we have to be told what should do and um, what is best at the end of the day for midwives, so, sorry, for women and uh, for um, outcomes and babies' outcomes as well. So are the women themselves used to having choice? Are they dealing with the not option really, of having choice? Not really. Not really. No. Uh, so, no, so it's a new uh, it's a new concept for them as well that they need to grasp. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's the 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 role of the antenatal midwives is quite uh, crucial. Um, just no only teaching or educating women on labour, but on their rights and on their options, like the autonomy and the choices that they can make during labour. Just a bit of theory of um, <laughs> legal theory. <laughs> let's say that let's put that and then let's use the word legal. Yes. Have you have you seen this comment about a woman who made a birth plan for her partner <laughs> to express <laughs> no. what she wanted from him? As being pragmatic, that man appreciated a lot because it was concrete. I can see that perspective actually. <laughs> Although you'd think that, again, that they could um, talk because talking and communicating ought to come to the same conclusion, really, particularly between a man and his, his wife or wife and her husband or partner, rather. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, this is also another um, tricky thing. Um, they, they, as a woman in labour, you need to have there someone who will be able to support you um encourage you and coach you and some people are not ready for that uh so sometimes you need to make sure who do you take with you to the labor world because for some partners or even for your sister or your mother um they are not they they can't do that and we all need to uh, know our friends or our relatives limitations and take care someone who can support us and that someone that we don't have to look after because we we have enough with <laughs> ourselves in labor and looking after ourselves and uh, and baby yes selena said men often don't know what to do and it's fun it's not fun to feel powerless mm -hmm. and our men do, uh, do men do the men attend the births in spain yes yes they do have they always done mm -hmm. that or is that recent as well? Uh, I think it's quite recent, not, not as recent as the birth plan, but <laughs> but yeah, they haven't been like that forever. Well, neither have they anywhere else, yeah. really. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's mm -hmm. quite uh, fancy and <laughs> new um, um, tied. It's all a very fascinating conversation, really. Mm -hmm. That's very healthy. I'm reading the chat. Get out of my it took a I took a healthy woman at 35 and a half weeks who wanted a water birth. She had an awesome water birth, but getting her, getting to help her celebrate it was a systematic challenge. What do you mean it was a systematic challenge, Irene? Hmm. No idea. I mean, some reception. Um, uh, oh, oh, are we, is that are we going to try and speak? <clears throat> okay. Would you like to speak, Irene? Irene Chain Kalvalski, that is. Yeah. 
that is a great midwife knowledge experience and wisdom oh. okay okay we're gonna see if my book uh, three blind mice I'm afraid your reception is really poor, Irene. Do you want to write it in the chat box? I'll write it in for you, no problem. Or whoever that was that was speaking just then. <laughs> well, have we got any more questions? Because we're coming up towards the end of the session. Any more comments? I think Irene's point that, um, what was that one in that previous um, slide? You said that uh, you said that the real achievement of the birth plan would be it's disappearing. I think that is spot on um, what we would like to see. And certainly um, uh, birth, birth plans in the UK now are um, less common because women do now know often that they've yeah. got choice and there's a lot more discussion and communication and explaining done correctly during pregnancy etc. Yeah, you're lucky um, you've been through that already like we are all in the transition <laughs> and we need a tool to support uh, the practices. Yes we're all at very different positions across the world yes but that's that's the usefulness of something like this conference where the all of everybody is able to come together and discuss um, these points because for some people in some parts of the world uh, having a safe environment in which to uh, enable the women give birth is is a higher priority than giving them um, choice. Even though choice should be given, mm -hmm. there are other there are other priorities, aren't there? It's very difficult for everybody. But we're all moving on, so that's fabulous. Yes, I like the title too, Hello. Celine. Okay, so I think we should wrap this up now. So I'm going to just go through the last few um, slides for everybody, if that's okay. So, uh, we've had the any questions bit. Oh, now, Irene, were you going to say something else? No, really, we finished. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs>